we are now to talk about SDG in Latin America and we talk about the beautiful things that happens in all Latin America. We start with Andres Bourbano that will be the chair from uh, Art Gallery for next year and he talked to us about his work. So hello, welcome everybody. It's pretty exciting to be here in this uh, panel on uh, CG in Latin America. I'm quite happy next year I will be uh, in charge of the art gallery in uh, Seagraph 2018 in Vancouver. And I'm gonna share with you some of the ideas I have to, to uh, run the exhibition and uh, some of the motivations uh, why I'm trying to to do there. Okay, so um, let me start with an introduction. Uh, the first thing that is very inspiring and interesting uh, of working in Canada is the big uh, deep tradition that Canada has in, um, in the media arts scene. Uh, for instance, two years ago there was uh, one of the most important events uh, that is in the field of media arts that is called ICEA, International Symposium on Electronic Arts. Uh, was hosted in Vancouver, like same place that Seagraph uh, is going next year. And um, we've been in contact with the team that organized that uh, um, ICEA there. Uh, just to, for you to know, this year ICEA was uh, hosted in Colombia, in Manizales. Col I'm from Colombia. And uh, we're very proud that we were able to run this event there in South America. Uh, one of the things that is more interesting to me of uh, Canada, the media arts scene there, is that uh, is where I learned some of my first experiences with immersive technologies I had there in Canada. Once in the uh, Banff um, Art Center, for instance, I attended to one exhibition and um, a series of lectures about the uh, first open, full open source cave they were building in the early 2000s. So it, the name of the professor was Pierre Boulanger, uh, and he was teaching at the University of Alberta with that idea of creating a cave that was completely open source. And uh, most recently, I've been going to Montreal often, and they have this stratosphere that is a very interesting uh, half dome for interactive uh, immersive experiences. And it's, it's very interesting to see that today, that we are you know, used to the VR with helmets, that is like quite an indiv individual experience, to still see that uh, kind of immersive collective experience, which is uh, very inspiring, I think. So my idea for next year's, uh, it's uh, to interconnect this kind of work, you know, like a pretty advanced media art scene, uh, a lot of interesting in the, uh, emerging technologies with some of the most ancient uh, traditions in, um, at the cultural level in Canada. So. One of the ideas is to bring together, you know, like a, a, the production of media artists and also uh, some um, cultural productions from indigenous communities or how are called there in Canada, native nations. Um, I've been uh, visiting uh, Northern Quebec for more than seven years, working with uh, my former uh, PhD advisor professor doing a documentary there where with communities, Cree communities. Uh, Cree is like one, uh, one of the uh, indigenous communities who live there in uh, uh, northern Canada and also Inuit. Uh, just to show you what I've been doing there, I will send a short video and uh, you're gonna stand, understand why is this is so meaningful. So I've been going there to the James Bay uh, in 2019, uh, 1972 
uh, George de Grady was invited by the communities to go and do like, a photographic documentation. And in 2012, he got an uh, NSF uh, grant to go back and present the photographic, photographic works that they did at the time, like 4,000 images, to bring those images back to the communities. So we did like a series of workshops, you know, taking these pictures to them. It was incredibly moving to see how people said, oh, that's my grandma, or that's my, my brother, and things like that. And we did all the time workshops with ethnographers taking care of the names of the people. And uh, it was incredibly uh, touching experience. So, because um, things are moving and, you know, changing faster there, uh, I was in charge of, you know, analyzing the, the photos uh, in order to do like the video documentation, right, of this process of taking these pictures back. So I'm going to share this experience with you. Uh, this is my first um, day in the Canadian sub-Arctic. Uh, first time, you know, they said, okay, we can go and paddle for a while in this small lake. I was testing my equipment, and eventually my camera fell down the lake, freezing lake. So then it's like, a, oh, what I want to do, right? Like forget about my footage that is there, or, uh, you know, go and, and jump for it. So I decided to jump. And, uh, you know, touching with my feet where the camera can be, and I was lucky enough that one guy was there to, to help me to do this kind of thing. He, was, uh, he had, like, experience doing this kind of things. And I was able to finally um, recover the camera and uh, really taste the coldness of the waters in the subarctic and um, kind of get, you know, a, a really a splash of what is, you know, it there. So... In few words, what I would like to, to combine there in, in the show is like this kind of you know immersive experiences with technology that we saw at the beginning, with this kind of more you know real immersive experiences, right? Like uh, are related to the open landscape and the interaction with the indigenous communities. So that's the main reason why I propose this uh, topic. It's quite ambitious, if you want, but I think you know I've been working several times with indigenous communities in Latin America, so I think. Uh, we discovered that we are just one continent, you know, with deep roots. Um, this is one example of the things that I did here with First Nations in um, in uh, Albuquerque, in New Mexico. I don't know if you are you familiar with the Cold Talkers story, Navajo Cold Talkers, like uh, indigenous communities from uh, New Mexico who went to this in the Second World War to the Pacific Front, and they developed like one cryptophonic language that was never deciphered by Japanese. Uh, it was a classified project until the 70s. And uh, this is a very strange story because it happens at the same time as the origins of computation, but in the other side of the world. Uh, so we were able to, to find one of these code talkers who is still living. He was 20, sorry, 92. When uh, he uh, gave the presentation, we invited him to an ICEA, and he came, you know. Most of the people said, no, those guys are too old, they don't remember anything. He came, you know, 92, you know, standing up like all the time, one hour and a half, like do, 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 speaking. And, uh, you know, this is also, you know, discovering that uh, indigenous community have like, like a lot to, to, to teach us, not just as a, you know, tradi in the traditional ways of living, but also as a main uh, builders of present time. It's just that we need to tell those, those stories or invite them to tell those stories to us. So then I started to do like a, a survey of art projects that are related to that, and there's like a, quite a few. Uh, this, for instance, is a project by Marco Belgian and um, Matthew Biederman that is called Artist Arctic Perspectives Initiative, and it's like a collective of people working especially with open source technologies going to the Arctic to work with the indigenous communities there. It's uh, unbelievable what they've been doing. Um, and they involved several people from Latin America, from Chile. They they got like a they did a, a like an award for um, a temporary housing in the, in the Arctic, and the the team who won that is Chil Chilean. Um, so the that's let's say how we would like to take this in a philosophical way, like uh, the, the the term the, the topic of the the exhibition would be origins, just to explore let's say from origins of the universe, uh, origins of life, right? The origins of human beings around the planet, um, and origins, that is one thing that I care a lot, origins of the collaboration between artists and technicians. Um, actually, right now I need to move to the arts papers 
um, session because we have a presentation about like one show that happened here in 88, for instance. So I've been doing a lot of research on the history and history is going to be an important part of this. This is, uh, for instance, like a show that uh, was part of SIGGRAPH in the 88, made by the uh, EVL, that one of the first visualization laboratories in the States. And um, just to close, like I, I'm trying to push myself to, to work in a theoretical, methodological way on how to put together the show. So um, I've been deeply inspired by this uh, German philosopher, it's a philo you know, philosopher on technology, Hitler is his name, and he has this amazing uh, text about uh, museums in the technical digital frontier, right? He was uh, invited in the 90s, you know, like in the first time of the effervescence uh, of, uh, you know, virtual reality, things like that, to talk about uh, the relationship between museums and, uh, and new technologies. And his, his answer was very inspiring. At the time, I think it was not that well understood, but I think now is the time to go. So let me try to summarize it. What he says is that museums, you know, asking if museums need to include new technologies like a VR or something like that, computers, it's just a matter of time that's going to happen. I mean, we don't need to take care of it. It's like, a, you know, more like a, the details of how the implementation will be. But it's, it's not possible to for an institution like a museum to close the doors to these new technologies. However, what he says is that instead we need to think on the architecture of the computers as a model to think on the architecture of the museums. And that's uh, quite inspiring. So he said like, uh, we have like these three instances of computers, like uh, memory, uh, processor, and transmission. And we eventually can take these three categories to think in museums or exhibitions. So memory is, for instance, the collection, right? Like the material that you select or curate. Then uh, the processing is the is how you des design the, the rules that you establish, right? Like 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 an algorithm, the rules that you establish to select and combine and uh, think on the display and transmission. It's related to and how you are delivering the content. So I'm gonna take this model uh, to 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 think if uh, we can really apply this methodology derived from the, this um, German philosopher and see if I can do something interesting with this. Uh, I just would like to close uh, saying that I'm extremely proud of the um, work that, that, that Paula has been doing uh, for the art gallery this year. It's unbelievable. 100% of the artworks in the art gallery uh, are from Latin America, from people working in Latin America. Um, it's an outstanding collection of artworks. I really invite you to go and see. It's like artworks from uh, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Cuba, Ecuador, um, which are really interesting proposals and contributions. So it's going to, for me, it's going to be very hard to, 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 to keep at that level that is now, but it's, it's, it's challenging enough and it's uh, incredibly nice to, to, to be working with this uh, community of people from Latin America really pushing the, the boundaries of how we design the exhibitions here in CIRA. So that's all. If you have questions, I will be very happy to answer. No questions? Okay. No questions. Uh,
beautiful works is thanks to Paul. Rodolfo Peraza 
Cuba, Leo Nunez from Argentina, and Cristiano Jarzum from Chile. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you a one-minute trailer of the art gallery, and uh, and with that, I'm going to really invite you to go and see the work. But you can see here what I can say. Uh, it's just a little bit of, uh, of what you actually can see in that gallery. And started Colombia, now you go to Argentina, I am Brazilian, and now I am moving for Chile. I covered all of Latin America with Gabriel Osorio. Hi, um, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, this is my second time here in Sigra. Uh, and the first time that I, that I came was two years ago, and was because I was uh, selected with this short film, that is the one that I will uh, talk a little bit about today, and it's called Bear Story. Um, well, uh, Bear Story, uh, 
first, I, I, am, um, I started making animation uh, almost 10 years ago. I have a company in Santiago, based in Santiago, Chile. It's called Punk Robot, and we specialize in CGI animation. Uh, we have made uh, on, uh, two TV series, and, and I think six years ago, and we started making this, this short film. So it was a very long process because making animation, uh, everybody that lives in, in Latin America knows that uh, it's, it's difficult to create CGI because uh, of the cost of the team, the cost of the process. It's mostly a, a, a budget problem, but if, if you have uh, enough time, you can you can make and, and I would think you can make a good good uh, artwork, right? You can make good animation. So. I think something very important that uh, we tried to make with their story was to tell a story that is uh, completely Latin American. Um, I, I will uh, tell you a little bit about, I don't know if some of you have seen the short film, for the ones that doesn't have seen it, uh, I, I brought some copies that you could take after the presentation in case you want to see it. And, and it's really a, a very simple story, it's a story about a bear that is uh, grabbed by the circus and it's separated from his family. So, in fact, it's a story about exile and, and that is uh, the story of Chile. And it's not only the story of Chile because exile and coup d'etat from military governments is a story that we in Latin America share with a lot of countries, right? Uh, it's the same story all, all around the, the, the region. So, um, this one here is my grandfather, he's called Leopoldo Osorio, and by, in, the, in the year 1973 he was working with the Salvador Allende government, that is a socialist, uh, was a socialist government, so when the coup d'etat, when this military government uh, came, uh, he was uh, in prison for two years, and then he was exiled from Chile for, for almost 20 years. So. My experience when I was a kid, when I, when I was born, uh, was that, that my grandfather wasn't there. I knew my grandfather only for, from pictures, like this one, you know, very blurry, 35 millimeters, very old. So I always remember asking my mother, uh, why my, my grandfather isn't here? Why, why he's not here, here with us, with his family? And my, my mother told me, no, because uh, he, the, the government, the Chilean government, did not, didn't allow him to enter the country. So, for me, as a kid, I, I never understood why, why, who, who my grandfather, what, what was the thing that he did that the government didn't allow him to enter. It, it was something that I never understood really. So, right now, you can see, you can see at the past, but you can understand the political situation in a country, so a people that think different, it doesn't be allowed to enter, but you could not justify that kind of way of thinking. You can, I, I myself cannot understand that this is the, the way that we resolve problems, right? Like separating people, like exiling people. So I really, um, I, I really wanted to put that idea in, in the short film, try to convey the idea that, that uh, family is something that is important, that is not, is not uh, the solution to problem is not separate, uh, separate people from, from his root. So I think that's something very important that myself as a director think that we have to make for Latin America, try to recover our histories, try to uh, convey messages that are uh, universal but at the same time are part of our history. So that's the way, that's the point where our story came from, is the it's inspiring the story of my of my grandfather. I will tell you a little bit about the inspiration, uh, just, just the, the thing that we did, of course we went to, uh, when we decided that the, the, the protagonist is going to be a bear, we went to uh, the zoo to try to draw bears, study bears, and, the story, the bear tells his own story through a mechanical diorama. So it's like an organ, like an, an organ, organ grinder. So the organ grinder is really common in Latin America and we try to recover that too, try to recover the aesthetics of Latin America. 
Um, and, and we did a really, uh, we don't have a very large budget, but we really, we really did a, a very uh, profound research of all the details that compose the film. So um, here are some drawings that uh, Antonio Herrera, the director, the art director of the film, did. Um, here are uh, some final concepts of the characters. So we really uh, try to to be uh, to create a world that is very very detailed. So I will, in the spirit of, of well, this is a, a concept of the backgrounds, and in all the concepts we really try to re to rescue to recover a uh, Latin American feeling, like the way the architecture works the way that the, the characters are designed. So in the, in the spirit of SIGGRAPH, I wanted to, to share some more technical aspects, like uh, we really wanted to differentiate us uh, from like uh, traditional CGI production, trying to create a group that is very organic. So we modeling we model everything in clay, and, and then we, with a very like do-it-yourself system, we 3D scan these models. It's a very home-made system, not nothing expensive. By by the time we have a very small budget, and and then we with, with this system we managed to to get a very detailed model that actually. Uh, got all the, the imperfections and the thing that we later uh, translated to the textures of the of the characters. Of course we then uh, retopologized everything so it could be animated and then projected the, the surface in the, in the textures. So that's a, a little bit about the, the technical aspect how we, how we did the film. Um, it's, it was a very long process. It was uh, four years, a, a long time for a 10 minutes film, and we we were not sure if, if the film is if you, if it was okay or not. And finally, we when, when we completed, we said we put so much heart in this, we put so much time, uh, so many people. It was for us it was 15 people. It's a small team, but very compromised. But uh, we decided to send to uh, uh, to show this to everyone, to everybody. So we sent the film to almost 300 festivals. We really wanted to to show to show them to the to the festival, to show them to the people, and most of all, try to convey the message, to get to the people, to see, uh, to feel what it's like to lose a person that that you love, a person that is part of your family. So we were very surprised because in the uh, festival circuit it went really, really well. And we, we, we sent it to 300, but it, it, we received, a, we received uh, almost uh, 50 awards. That is a lot and we were very, very happy. It's, it's important to, to know that from 300 festivals, 200 festivals, uh, says say, say to us, no, you are not selected, you are out of the selection. So I think that's important that uh, you are going to try 300 times and 200 times you are going to be rejected, uh, but that's not, you don't have to stop trying, right? We still uh, continue sending the, the film to festivals and, and finally we receive um, an Oscar qualifying award that we at the time we didn't knew what it means <laughs> uh, um, because it was our first short film we, we, we didn't knew how the festival circuit actually worked so uh, we received this the Oscar qualifying was the, the ones that are more big in the left part of the screen the one from Cleveland, River Run and Nashville so um, we were really happy because it, it was a chance to actually uh, get our film seen, uh, seen by the Academy members. So we sent the film for, uh, for uh, Academy consideration and then we received the great news that we were nominated for, a, for, a, for an Oscar. So that was great because 
Uh, in fact, it was the first time that a Latin American animation was nominated so for, for an Oscar. So it, it, uh, we feel that we were not only representing Chile, but all the Latin American region, and, uh, and that was uh, uh, just being nominated was something great, great for us. So um, when we when we got when we got the nomination, the first thing that happens in February, this is last year, um, we got an invitation to this nominee's luncheon. That it was where when the Academy took a picture of the all the nominees of that year, and if you look very carefully, like uh, finding Wally, I don't know how to name in English. Um, you can see there is a Latin American representing the animation of, of this part of the world. And if, if you don't believe me, here is a, <laughs> a close-up. And it, it was a very incredible, amazing experience in the in the sense that, uh, of course, yeah, it's all, all of the, these stars and people that are very, very famous, you know, uh, I think it was like Leo DiCaprio in the same picture. So it, it was a crazy, but the thing for me, most important than, than, than that, it was that it, it, it was an opportunity to meet uh, directors, to meet people that actually inspired me to, to create animation. So it, it was a, a, great, a great moment for us. Um, well, this, uh, this is a couple of, of pictures from the, from the academy, from the ceremony, the actual ceremony. We didn't knew that we are going to receive an award. It, everything was like a surprise. Um, nobody said, uh, told you uh, first that what, what is going to happen. And, and in this year it was a select, uh, selection of uh, Richard Williams, the, the one that were nominees with us, was Richard Williams. Um, one picture from Pixar, uh, one picture um, from Don Herzl, and it was the, uh, another picture from a Russian director that was uh, previously nominated too. So in fact, all the, the person that were nominated was, uh, was actually a, an Oscar winner before, so we, did, we think that we don't have, we haven't any chance to win, you know, like it, this is impossible. Like, it, of course, it's going to win Pixar, but be here is great, so, so whatever, we are not uh, hoping to win, we just, are, we were happy to be there and, and have that amazing experience. But it, it was really an enormous surprise for us that we actually uh, received the award. Um, the, the members of the Academy vote for our picture and, and we were really happy because uh, in, in some way it, it was uh, a feeling that all these years of work not only uh, were important but it's important that there is another way of making films, you know, like not all the films has to be done like the, like, you know, like the Pixar or Disney way with millions of, um, millions of dollars, but you can make, you can create aesthetics, you can tell different stories, and it, there are, uh, it can be good stories too. So here is just a couple, a couple of silly pictures that we took after the receiving the award. Um, uh, we were very happy because we met Sofia Vergara, that is like uh, the, the best Colombian actress. Um, and, and yeah, when we, and I had the opportunity to meet um, to meet John. So uh, for me, it was a, a great experience because when I see when I saw Toy Story one, like a lot of years ago in the cinemas, I, I was a kid, and Toy Story one was. The the picture that I, when, when I saw that picture, I said, how, how the hell are these pictures made? And I said to myself, I need to know how this is done. Uh, and, and I want to make that kind of picture, that kind of film. So in, in, in some sense, uh, John, John Lasseter was one of the creators that inspired me to make 3D art. So I think that's, that's in, in a way, complete a cir completed a, a circle in my in my career in, in some way. So, well, sorry. Um, the thing is, 
the important thing for us uh, beyond the actual work, right? Actual because your work is it, it, not it's not it's nothing in itself. It's the thing that comes with your work. Um, back in Chile, this was very very important. We were like in first pages of every newspaper. In fact, uh, even the government realized that animation is something important. And I, as a director, feel that animation is not only important because of the development of the, of the technology. It's important because of the development of the art, because of the rescue of the, his, the histories, the stories that we are telling. By We have to recover our roots or our stories that we have in Latin America. And I think that's something really, really important that, that we have to realize that what, what is the the social uh, function of the animation. It's not just entertain. I think it's the entertain part is the most important. But it's not just entertainment. It's part of uh, who we are as as a as a, a as a society. It's, it's animation tells our stories, the same as cinema or other. Uh, our manifestations, right? So, for, for us, that uh, in some way the Oscar opened up uh, a lot of um, doors in Chile for animation. And in fact, this is a picture. Uh, uh, as soon as we go back to Chile, and uh, like um, uh, a van from the government take us directly to the House of Government, and this is a picture with Michelle Bachelet, that is the president. We were received like heroes. It's like. Uh, Right now, they are like putting a name on the street with a well, street with my name. It's so very, it's very uh, crazy, but uh, it, it was a, uh, something really important, and the, and the government realized that. And I think, in some way, it was uh, something that opened the eyes in the region, because right now in Argentina, in, in Peru, in Colombia, we are realizing that uh, we have a, potential, uh, a lot of potential to make animation. So this is the picture of the other side, you know, like my, the, it's just for you to get the idea of how much uh, attention this, this grab. So, well, um, to, to summarize, uh, I think that that's very important for us uh, to, to understand that uh, we can make, uh, as a Latin Americans, we can make a, a cinema that uh, no, it's not necessarily to be the same cinema that is uh, created, created here in, in, in the U.S. We have to, to make a cinema that tells our own stories. And, and I think that's uh, something very that, that we have to recover. Um, finally, I made, uh, when we were nominated, we were always, you know, like uh, recording with our cell phones. And, uh, my producer make a little montage of all the all these uh, different goofy moments. So it's just uh, I will share with you a video. It's very silly.